Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the July 2021 general meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. I'm going to be your host tonight, Jeremy Feldman. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Jeremy couldn't be with us tonight, so uh, he asked me to, uh, to host, so I figured I had the least amount of hair to lose, so I uh, decided to go ahead and uh, uh, host this meeting in his stead. Uh, let me get started with a few preliminaries. We've got a great program tonight uh, with uh, Bill Wilson going to talk about the sun this evening. So let me cover a few odds and ends first. All right, so uh, this we are the Memphis Astronomical Society. We are a uh, public service uh, educational uh, society. We're not just an astronomy club. We've been uh, an astronomy uh, We've been in a 501c3 society since 1957, I think it was. Um, and <clears throat> um, we try to have a couple of, uh, at least one meeting a month where we make presentations uh, uh, about astronomy and or related sciences, and then uh, have public observing sessions every month. You can uh, follow us on uh, Facebook. We've got a Facebook page. We have a Twitter uh, account that uh, you can find us at, at society underscore Memphis. And then, uh, of course, on our YouTube channel, uh, uh, Memphis Astron Society, hopefully uh, you are seeing us there and you will uh, click the subscribe button when you get a chance. So let me... This is the uh, Memphis Astronomical Society website. You can find us at memphisastro.org, memphisastro.org. Uh, we keep a lot of good information here, including our uh, uh, calendar of events and stuff. You can, uh, if you click on the, uh, over on the right-hand side where it says join, it will uh, bring up a form you can fill out and become a member of the Memphis Astronomical Society. Um, uh, dues are only $25 a year and while that probably really doesn't buy you that much, what it does is goes a long way to help support us and what we try to do to be of public service every month. So um, thank you very much and join and follow us if you want to. Uh, there's, um, there's actually another button on the website now that says subscribe and that'll sign you up to our newsletter which you're welcome to do without joining at all, not our newsletter, but to our email distribution of notices and stuff. All right, so you can also get our newsletter by going to joinmas.com and filling out the uh, little quick form there, just your name and email address, and we'll send you about one email a week. Um, Typically, we send out a go and no go notice for our observing sessions, and we'll send out a notice about the upcoming meetings, uh, the topics, and then, of course, any Memphis area related astronomy events that might be going on that we're aware of to try to let you know about it so you can uh, participate in those. Not too many emails, at least not by advertising standards. And also on our calendar, find our, um, also on our website, you can find our calendar uh, where we try to post all of our public uh, uh, observing and meeting events. For the month of July, you can see we uh, last weekend we had uh, observing in our Burton Stark Sky site. We've got another one scheduled for this Saturday night. Uh, I haven't even looked at the weather yet. Uh, there is a observing session, a public observing session at Shelby Farms Park uh, next weekend on Saturday. Um, that's park, parking area five 
that's just to the right as you come off of uh, Walnut Grove and you make a left on that road that goes through the park. There's a driveway to the right that parks on the south side of the lake and we'll be there uh, set up after dark to do some observing, hopefully, if the weather permits. And all these are, by the way, if the weather permits and cloud cover breaks. Uh, on the 24th, Saturday night, the 24th, the Memphis Astrophotography Group will have a Zoom meeting. Um, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then we've got another observing session at Burton at our dark sky site on Saturday the 31st. I'd like to welcome, uh, we'd like to let you know about a newly established committee and uh, of, this is mostly MAS members, some of board members that are uh, going to be responsible, responsible. They're going to try to help coordinate our public outreach events and uh, stuff. We get requests all the time for presentations or uh, school events, uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, request to the Memphis Astronomical Society to put on an observing session or make some kind of uh, astronomy related presentation. And uh, you can get in touch with any of these folks. Um, most of these are on our website. They have contact information on our website. Uh, I hadn't validated with them that I could share their email address on a YouTube video yet, so I didn't, but uh, uh, Sarita Joshi has uh, uh, taken up that position so far, and uh, if you'll email Sarita and let her know your interest and what you're looking for, she will get with the rest of us and try to get something lined up for you, either uh, people with telescopes or people who can make presentations. Uh, of course, this is all volunteered and sometimes just nobody's available, but uh, we do what we can. I'd like to welcome some new members this month, and it is quite the tradition at the Memphis Astronomical Society for new members not to show up at the next meeting after they've been uh, approved and made members. So we'll see how that tradition holds tonight. The first person I'd like to introduce is Mike Bond. Uh, from Collierville. He's got a new telescope, wants to start using it. And I don't see Mike in our observing on our uh, participant list, but going to the next one is Dan Shipley, who joined this month as well. And uh, all I got about him, he's from Germantown and is new to astronomy. So welcome, Dan. Next up is Josh Hood. Um, just all I know is interested in astronomy and he's in Memphis. So uh, welcome to the Memphis Astronomical Society, Josh. Then Glenda Mendina is uh, on our list and uh, appears to be actually at the meeting. So uh, welcome to the MAS, uh, Glenda and uh, glad to have you. And last but not least, Craig Nicholson. And I can see Craig here, but uh, uh, Craig is interested in astrophotography and he's joined our group. So welcome to the new members of the Memphis Astronomical Society. We hope that you uh, get something out of it and I know we will uh, benefit from your membership and participation. So thank you very much. Memphis Astronomical Society has a newsletter that is sent to the uh, paying members of our society. It's probably the single, we were trying to think when it one board meeting, what being a paying member actually got you. Because <laughs> You know, you're welcome to attend our meetings. You're welcome to come to our observing sessions. Uh, paying just helps support us and you get the newsletter. So 
If you're not a paying member, don't expect to receive this in your email. But it's a pretty cool newsletter. We've got, uh, uh, we try to have an article in there once a month written by one of our uh, members, typically. Uh, we'll have uh, astrophotography in there, typically by uh, some of our members. Uh, we'll have a monthly sky chart in there, a calendar of events, uh, maybe some upcoming uh, uh, astronomical things to observe or pay attention to, uh, the regular uh, meeting minutes from our board of directors meetings, and uh, typically a little blurb in there about our astrophotography group that we started up a few minutes ago. Uh, we will be uh, meeting again uh, July 24th. That meeting starts at 7 p.m. and that Zoom link is on our website as well. Um, anyone is welcome to attend. You do not have to be an astrophotographer. You, you don't even have to be interested in astrophotography. It probably helps, but uh, you're welcome to attend in any case. Currently, we are diving into image processing using a program called PixInsight, which appears to be probably the premier astrophotography editing software package out there. And um, we have a one of our members is a experienced astrophotographer with a lot of experience with this particular uh, software package and is really doing a lot of good things and helping us learn the steps and processes of what they do and how to use them to process our uh, image files that we take with our cameras and telescopes when we're out doing astrophotography. Um, we also, during those meetings, are certainly able to and welcome any questions not related to image processing. So if you've got, if you're getting started in astrophotography and have questions or, or uh, want to share something that you just figured out, uh, please join us. We'll, we'll stop. Uh, uh, I typically try to start out asking if there's any questions that anybody wants to bring up or talk about before we dive into the image processing lesson for the month. But uh, uh, and if there is, we'll talk about it, and work through it, and try to help out. Uh, we have a number of experienced uh, people in various uh, methods here, either with DSLRs, uh, astrophotography-based cameras and specialized cameras, both color and uh, black and white, and uh, lots of uh, different variations on that thing. So join us for... Uh, uh, your trip into astrophotography. Uh, at the uh, Jeremy always posts links to our current scar, uh, sky map and a current um, uh, uh, printable paper form to join the Memphis Astronomical Society uh, to the each one of these YouTube videos when he publishes it. So. Look for that at the bottom of the video. Um, if you want to, you know, like use a, you know, a pencil and fill out a form, you still can. We will take it. Fill out one of those forms, mail it to us, and uh, we'll get your membership process. Let's see. All right. So tonight uh, we have a uh, very long-term member of the Memphis Astronomical Society. He's been doing solar observations since the sun started to shine, I think. Uh, he's a member of the uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers. He's gotten numerous awards and certificates of, of, of progress or, or contribution, he has turned in, I, didn't I see by over 5,000 ob, uh, observations uh, on their website? Uh, you can go to the AABSO website, and type in Bill Wilson, and it, it, you'll see him there. Uh, that's how famous he is. 
And uh, uh, so Bill knows a little bit about uh, uh, looking at sunspots, and he's going to uh, talk about that some tonight. And uh, again, you want to get on our newsletter, go to uh, joinmas.com, fill in your name and email, and uh, we'll be glad to let you know what's coming up. And I think that's pretty much got the preliminaries done. Um, this is how you can follow us. So, Bill, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you as soon as I can find out where the... There it is. So... Take it away. Uh, Rick, you've uh, disabled participant screen sharing, so you'll, uh, I'll have to, you'll have to how, edit how, that. How, un, uh, uh, how unappropriate of me. There you go. Got it back. All right, let's, let's try this now. Okay, there we are. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Bill Wilson. I've been a member of the Memphis Astronomical Society uh, since uh, 1979. I, I noticed in the blurb there, so I've been a member, I've been observing the sun since 79. I want to assure you that is 1979 and not 1879. <laughs> uh, it does, at times it does seem like it's been about that long. Um, I, I'll, I'll get into how I got uh, into observing the sun in just a little bit, but just uh, uh, a little historical uh, introduction. Well, that's, um, there we go. Okay, now I'm into it. This is uh, the sun photographed through fog. Uh, somebody did that, posted it on Reddit. Uh, in May of 2015, um, this is how people saw sunspots before there were telescopes, through smoke or fog, uh, thick clouds, and so on. And I have seen this on occasion. Uh, people had been doing this and have, have talked about this for thousands of years. Um, the, some of the ancient uh, African people who lived along the Zambezi River uh, thought that the jealous moon had, had flung mud onto the face of the sun. Uh, people interpret uh, things they don't understand. That uh, Often it's, uh, there's some things we don't understand, they must be supernatural. And so this was what these people thought. Uh, um, ancient Chinese astronomers, uh, sometimes saw them as the building blocks of a celestial palace. Other times they might interpret them as uh, sort of crude brush strokes uh, of writing uh, that would, would uh, link to the names of, of famous people. The ancient Roman poet Virgil, uh, who wrote the Aeneid and other things, uh, thought that sunspots viewed through uh, fog, in the morning, predicted showers later on during the day. It's tempting to do that, to look at a big sunspot. Now, we don't have any that big currently, but we have and we will. It's tempting to do that, to look at it through smoke or fog, but don't do it. Uh, you can glance at it. That's probably safe enough. In particular, do not use unfiltered optical aid uh, binoculars or a telescope because the infrared light can and probably will damage the, your corneas and the retinas of your eye and you won't be aware of it while it's happening. Uh, several years ago, I think it was in uh, 2006, there was a transit of Mercury, that is the planet Mercury crossed the sun as seen from the earth. Uh, that happens about 13 times per century and so I and uh, a few other um, MES members went over to Shelby Farms to set up our telescopes and show it to the public. And I went into the visitor center 
and asked to ask if it was okay for us to do that. And I spoke with the, the man who was uh, then the executive director, and he says, oh yeah, that's great. It fits in with our mission. We'll be happy to have you. And he said, uh, yeah, I said, I, you know, I, I, my office gives me a good view of sunset over the lake. And he said, sometimes when it's, uh, uh, you know, kind of cloudy or hazy over that way, uh, he said, I, I've looked at the sun, I've picked my binoculars up and I've, uh, I've looked at the sun and I've seen some big sunspots there. And I said, uh, don't do that. Don't do that. That's that infrared uh, radiation particularly concentrated through binoculars can start to cook parts of your retinas and you won't know it, uh, but it can do some damage that, that can't be undone. Now it is safe to look at the sun through a shade 14 welder's glass. I would not use anything any lighter. Uh, some people would have talked about using a shade 12. Um, I would not do that. You might get by with it, but you know, who wants to take a chance in uh, losing your vision? Um, some years ago, quite a few years ago, uh, when I found out about shade 14 welder's glass being an acceptable way to look at the sun, I called around welding supply shops uh, to try to find some, and they were not very common. Uh, I had to call two or three before I found somebody that had them, and I went over there and I bought a couple of them before they sold them out. I still got them. And then when I went to Hawaii in uh, July 1991 to see a total eclipse of the sun, um, the tour group uh, handed out shade 14 welders glasses as well. So I've, I've got a couple of a couple more. But that, it's safe to do it that way. Do not use uh, any kind of uh, optical aid that amplifies light or concentrates light unless it is uh, filtered with an acceptable filter. Mylar is a, is a good filter. Um, it's inexpensive. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Rick Honey has conducted some demonstrations of how to make solar filters for binoculars and for telescopes using Mylar and cardboard strips. Uh, this is a perfectly good way to do it. Um, I use a glass filter, which I will get to uh, in just, just a little bit. Uh, glass is better. It's much more expensive. It's better. Uh, mylar, uh, you have to be careful that it does not develop pinholes that could let an unacceptable amount of light through. What about uh, observing through the telescope? The telescope was not invented until the early 17th century. And a man named Thomas Harriot in England had observed the sun in 1610 and maybe as early as 1608, but he didn't publish. And in science, if you didn't publish, you just didn't do it. Uh, so it was Galileo who first published observing the sun. He had started observing the sun in 1610. And in 1613, he published a pamphlet or actually it was published for him by the Academy of Lynxes. He was a member of this. It was the uh, Academia de Linche. Uh, it was a, a scientific society founded in 1603 uh, in Rome, and he was a member of it. And this is the cover of that publication. It was written in Italian rather than Latin. This is, uh, this is something that was unusual at the time because Latin was the language of learning people and important publications, uh, particular science were always written in Latin. This one was not, it was written in, in the common language in, in Italy, uh, well, they were one of the Italian dialects, probably the one spoken in Tuscany and Rome. But certainly, well, it says there is dedicated among others to uh, the Duke uh, Cosimo II, Grand Duke of, of Tuscany. What he found was that sunspots existed, they came in groups, they grew, they expanded, they developed. He discovered that the sun rotates on its axis. I did too. I independently discovered the rotation of the sun. When I began observing the sun, this was because I was ignorant and didn't know Galileo had already done it 370 years before I did it. 
But all the same, I discovered the rotation of the sun because when I started observing it, uh, this was during a, a particularly good solar maximum in 1979, 1980. And I observed it one day and I saw all these big spots on there. And I thought, well, that's, that's, very, that's very nice. I'm, I'm going to look at this again. And I did the next day and they had moved. And the day after that, they had moved some more. And I thought, well, there were two possibilities here. Either sunspots are moving on the face of a, of a stationary sun or the sun itself is rotating. And so I did a little reading and you, you, know, you couldn't go on the internet and look this up then because the internet did not exist. So I went to the library and got some books out and found that uh, uh, the sun does indeed rotate on its axis as does everything in the solar system. In fact, uh, a physicist, and I can't remember his name now, once said, everything spins, everything spins from subatomic particles through asteroids, to planets, to the sun, to the solar system, to galaxies. Everything spins, okay, it all rotates. And we can learn a lot about uh, physical properties of uh, a lot of things from the, from the spin of atoms. This is how MRI works, magnetic resonance imaging. It works off uh, the spin of the hydrogen atom and it, how it changes in a magnetic field. So Galileo discovered that the sun rotates and he disproved the dogma from Aristotle of a pure unblemished ether. I, Aristotle would have called it ether, we would say ether. Uh, it comes from, the word comes from a Greek verb, ethane, meaning to burn or shine. So the ether was where the shiny things are. It was the pure uh, unsullied element of it, it was was higher of a higher literally and figuratively higher than the corrupt elements of earth air fire and water that the Greeks thought made up everything uh, terrestrial but the, the, the moon the sun everything else was this pure unblemished ether and Galileo's drawings of the sun actually tracings of the sun uh, from projection showed that it was not so. He invited a, uh, a, a church leader, a cardinal, whose name uh, I cannot recall right now, uh, whom he knew, and he invited me to come up and I will show you these spots that I've seen on the sun. So he projected them onto a, onto a, a sheet of paper, and the churchman who was a devotee of Aristotle and Aristotle's dogma, which had somehow been incorporated into church teaching, looked at it and he said, I see nothing and refused to admit that it existed. Here are some of Galileo's drawings that he made um, in 1612 from July 2nd to July 8th. And you can look at uh, some of these and you will see the rotation of the sun become apparent and the development of the groups. Uh, for example, we can look here and say in um, uh, the third line, from the top, the third row from the top, starting on the left. Uh, you can see a couple of big groups, north and south at the equator, uh, smaller groups toward the limb. You can see here in the second drawing, they moved more and more to the right. Again, they moved some more. And the development of groups too, that is they can start out simple and become complex, or when depending on when you first observe them, they can be complex and then degrade. Um, here, for example, uh, the uh, second row from the bottom, you can see that there were se several groups of sunspots, pretty big group here, big group here. The second drawing, um, you can see they have moved and they've also developed in several ways. And here they've begun to degrade, they've degraded even further here, and they're going away over here. So um, they come and they go, uh, it's on a scale of anywhere from hours to uh, even months, sometimes a great big group, uh, well, like, like these, uh, uh, these very, very large groups can survive a full rotation of the sun and come back uh, a couple of weeks after they disappear, they'll come back on the other side of the sun. That's unusual, but I've seen it happen a number of times. In fact, one, uh, 
one of those groups just rotated off the face of the sun a couple of days ago that had been around uh, the previous month. Heinrich Schwaber was an apothecary in what is now Germany. He lived in a little town called Dessau, about 20 miles from Berlin. Uh, Dessau uh, is probably, is close enough to Berlin, it's probably a suburb of Berlin today. Uh, he made his living as an apothecary who had a, at a drugstore uh, and was an amateur scientist, but most scientists at the time he lived, uh, particularly early in his life, were amateurs. There were hardly any professional scientists. He observed the sun and he tried to find a planet between Mercury and the sun. Uh, a planet had been hypothesized to be there and it had even been given a name. It was called a Vulcan. This has nothing to do with uh, Star Trek, which had not even been dreamed of at the time, but Vulcan was the Roman god of the forge and of fire. And if you've ever been to Birmingham, Alabama, uh, on Red Mountain, which overlooks the city of Birmingham, there is a tower, and on top of the tower is a cast iron statue of Vulcan. He stands there with a torch in his, or actually it was a, it's no longer a torch. When I grew up there, it was a torch, a neon torch. And they replaced, since they replaced it with a spear, which was the original uh, implement that he held in his hands. It's a spear in his right hand and his left hand holds a hammer uh, resting on an anvil. Uh, and uh, so you, you can see a, a statue of Vulcan. Uh, uh, Vulcan's name also survives in these mountains that belch fire, volcanoes, and it's called volcanology. Or, vul or vul uh, volcanology or volcanology is the study of volcanoes. So a little digression there, but uh, Schwabe observed the sun. He drew it uh, every day he could. I mean, he didn't do it when it was cloudy, it was raining. Uh, he drew it every day he could from 1825 to 1867. So 42 years he did this. He didn't find a planet, but he noticed that the numbers of spots rose and fell over about 10 years. We now know that the cycle is, is, uh, varies from about eight to about 16 years with an average of 11 years. In fact, the last cycle, cycle 24, uh, which just ended in uh, 2019, was exactly 11 years, 11.0. That's unusual. It usually is it's close to 11, but it varies a little bit. He published a one-page paper in 1843 in a German journal, Astronomische Nachricht, which translates to uh, astronomical news. And he outlined the, what, uh, obviously not this uh, graph, but uh, the uh, waxing and waning of sunspots over an approximately 11 year period. This is uh, a series of sunspot cycles from 1700 up to uh, present day. Um, the left side, um, the, the side that is uh, colored uh, uh, brown there, not blue, is based on sparser data, might might even say spotty uh, data. Um, and the, since uh, about 1750, 1755, we've had much better and more complete data. And that's why we can uh, map the sunspot cycles out. And you can see there are sometimes a whole lot of them, uh, great big maxima, and other times the maxima such as 18, uh, 18, uh, 10, 18, 20, 1825 uh, are pretty pretty small. Then there was a great maximum uh, that peaked in 1957 here. I was, I was around in 1957, but I was not uh, yet an uh, amateur astronomer. So I was uh, unaware of that, which is too bad. I got into it uh, here in this 1979, 1980 peak, and I've observed uh, uh, through these cycles. And here we're, we had a, a very weak uh, maximum here, the, the last one, or in 20, uh, 2012, 2013, that was the weakest maximum in over 100 years. And you got to go back uh, all the way, all the way back to around 1910 to, to find uh, a weaker maximum. Now, 
um, I'm, I'm sure I would get questions if I didn't bring this up. I'd get questions about the Maunder minimum. Uh, this is named for Edward Maunder and his wife, Annie Russell Maunder, who studied how sunspots uh, changed over time uh, on, in solar latitudes. Uh, they had read the work of an earlier researcher on this, Gustav Spur, and what they found was the what we now call the butterfly diagram. Um, turns out that new sunspots, new with the new the beginning of a new cycle, tend to form at high solar latitudes as the cycle progresses. They move closer and closer to the equator, that is the formation of the sunspots. The, the sunspots that formed at the beginning of the cycle obviously go away, they decay and so on, uh, long before the mid-cycle, let alone the end of it. But new spots form closer and closer to the equator as the uh, cycle progresses. And around the time of sunspot minimum, they're going to be along the equator and then you're going to have a blank sun a lot of days. It's just like a cue ball. And then when you begin to see new spots forming at high latitudes, that's one indication that we're, we're about to move into a new cycle. That has to be confirmed by magnetic measurements of magnetic fields and polarity and so forth. But a real clue to uh, an observer who does not have that equipment is that if they're forming at high latitudes after a sunspot minimum, then we're, we're about to start into a new cycle. The longer minimum was a period during which very few sunspots were observed over a period of about 70 years, from 1645 to about 1715. Uh, people did look, they did find some sunspots, but there were very few of them uh, compared to what we, what Galileo saw, you saw his drawings, there were a lot of sunspots in uh, 1612. And over the, the next, uh, well, century or so, they, they did, uh, they formed a lot of them early on, and then they almost completely disappeared. That coincided with a particularly cold period in Europe. It was called the Little Ice Age. And when uh, uh, John Eddy, the uh, solar physicist, brought it, brought this up, and I wrote a book, and it came out in uh, about 19, I'm trying to remember the date on it now, 1976 or thereabouts, 70 something, uh, about the Maunder Minimum and its relation to the Little Ice Age. And people jumped to the conclusion that the dearth of sunspots caused the Little Ice Age, that because there were no sunspots, they got a lot colder. Well, turns out the Little Ice Age extended a lot further than that. It started in the early uh, 14th century and it went on until the mid 19th century. So it was much longer than just the uh, 70 years or so of the Maunder minimum. It was not uniform around the world. Uh, it had warm periods interspersed with cold periods. And there was some correlation with the solar cycle, uh, but what we learned in elementary statistics classes is correlation does not imply causation. It does make you look at it closer. It suggests uh, a relationship, perhaps causal, but it's a, a logical error to reason in Latin uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc uh, after this, therefore, because of this. Other factors that are also correlated with the Little Ice Age were volcanic activity, which is known to affect climate and ocean circulation, which also does, uh, again, uh, it's complex. Uh, I think the lack of sunspots was not the uh, main uh, reason, perhaps did not contribute at all to the Little Ice Age, but uh, because uh, when you get into talking about sunspots and sunspot cycles, uh, somebody's always going to bring up the Maunder minimum. How do they form? Um, this is what we think happens. The sun has a north magnetic pole and a south magnetic pole, like a bar magnet. And if a magnetic field line 
forms between the North Magnetic Pole and the South Magnetic Pole, uh, links it and uh, the sun rotates, but it rotates not as a solid body because it isn't a solid body. It rotates faster at the equator than it does at the poles. It rotates once every 25 days or so at the equator, and it's more like 30 days to make one rotation at the poles. So what happens to those magnetic field lines? They get stretched. They're pulled faster at the equator than they are at the poles. And over a few rotations, they begin to get wrapped up in themselves, get tangled, uh, highly twisted magnetic fields develop. And these strong fields break through, it says the surface. Okay, the sun doesn't have a surface in the sense that uh, a ball or a piece of paper has a surface. It has the photosphere. That's the part, the part that is visible in white light that we can see. It breaks through that layer of the sun in tight loops and the strong magnetic fields inhibit the heat flow, the rising of packets of uh, hot plasma, hot gas from the interior of the sun. It suppresses those, it pushes them aside. And because those hot packets don't make it all the way to the, to the top of the photosphere, uh, those areas are cooler than the surrounding photosphere. They're still really, really hot. They measure at about 3,800 degrees Kelvin, uh, but the surrounding photosphere is more like 5,800 Kelvin. So they look dark by comparison. Uh, if you could pull one off and put it in the night sky, it would outshine the full moon. Uh, they're they're uh, a big one would. They're, they're quite, uh, quite bright, uh, but it's the contrast between the, that temperature and the surrounding temperature that makes them look black. And you'll see also that the polarity of the loops uh, are different in the northern and southern hemispheres. That changes over uh, the, the solar cycle. This is a, a kind of a quick uh, overview of solar anatomy. The core is where the energy starts. This is where uh, gravitational pressure and heat fuse hydrogen, hydrogen atoms into helium atoms, releasing energy in the process uh, in accordance with Einstein's famous formula E equals mc squared. There is a radiative zone that uh, these uh, very energetic photons move through. They start off as gamma rays. They move through this radiative zone over a period, a very long period, it's hundreds of thousands, maybe even thousands of years uh, bouncing off of particles, uh, eventually uh, getting tamer as they, uh, losing energy as they come out, and then they reach the convective layer. And this is where the hot gas rises as it does in a, a furnace that is not forced air, like the furnace that was in the house that I grew up in, uh, didn't have a fan in there, it was in the basement, it burned gas, and gas, the uh, hot, uh, hot air uh, came up through pipes and uh, through convection and came out of radiators in the floor and it uh, was convected around the room. So that was the convective layer. Uh, <clears throat> it reaches the photosphere, which is again, the part of the sun that we can see. This is where you can see the sunspots. Now, there are also um, features called faculae. Uh, it's up here, the faculae uh, is a, it's a Latin word, it means a little torch. The, word, the Latin word for torch is fax, F-A-X, which has nothing to do with the now obsolescent way of transmitting information over a telephone line. Its early observers saw that and uh, thought that it resembled uh, little torches on the sun, so they're called uh, faculae, uh, facula being a diminutive of fax. And you, you still see these, you can see them uh, when they're particularly when they're close to the solar limb, and uh, you see the phenomenon of limb darkening there, you see that on planets with atmospheres as well. Uh, what you're doing is looking through more of the atmosphere of that body, and that's why it looks dark. Uh, it makes it easier to see the faculae when they are uh, close to the limb. When they're in the middle of the disk, you can still see them sometimes, but uh, they're, they're harder to see. Um, Prominences are loops of plasma 
that are connected to have their roots in sunspots. And they're called prominences when they are visible against the black of space. And they are, are uh, sort of reddish when they, when they are in uh, profile against the, uh, the sun, against the disk of the sun, they look dark and they're called filaments. You can't see these in ordinary white light. You have to see these in the light of hydrogen alpha. And uh, when you do, you'll see them uh, across the face of the sun as filaments. And then when they rotate uh, around to the limb, then you will see them against the black of space. And then they're called prominences, but it's the same thing. Uh, granulation is the rising of these hot packets of gas out of the radiative zone of the sun. They come up in, uh, they, they look granular you know, on a particularly good day of observing, very steady air. Uh, you can see them uh, and they resemble, I, I've heard them called rice grains. This was, a, there was a French astronomer who said he thought they looked like uh, rice being cooked in a pot. Uh, I don't think so. I think they look more like an orange peel. And you can see them on a, on a really good day. They are uh, very large. They, they are about the size of Texas, about uh, 750 to 1,000 miles across. Uh, that is, in, in the United States, they're, they're compared to the size of Texas. In Europe, they're compared to the size of France. I mean, you, you talk about what you know. Uh, France is not quite as big as Texas, but it's, it's uh, the largest by area um, country in, uh, in Western Europe. Uh, flares um, come out of uh, sunspots. They are sudden releases of energy that are stored in the magnetic fields. Uh, when the magnetic fields uh, separate and then reconnect, a uh, tremendous amount of energy is released. And then the solar wind, that's the, the uh, uh, blowing away of ionized gas from the, from the sun. The corona, you see, uh, unless you have a coronagraph, a special instrument, you can only see that during a total solar eclipse. And those of us who were fortunate enough to see the total solar eclipse in 2017 did see the corona surrounding the black moon, uh, which had completely obscured the bright uh, photosphere of the sun. Uh, it was not a, as dramatic as it is during periods of high solar activity when you will see uh, what looked like big rays and uh, uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, activity in the corona. So how do we observe it? Projection is a safe way to do it. Um, this method is okay for uh, observing an eclipse or partial eclipse, just to hold the binoculars up be sure you don't look directly through them. And you project the image of the sun onto a screen. Now you're gonna to have to uh, shade the screen somewhat because the bright sunlight is gonna wash out that image. Uh, you can do it like this. You can do it off a mirror, get a better image, a bigger image at any rate, uh, darken them as much as possible. And again, never ever look through the sun directly with any instrument that is not safely filtered because it can blind you. Using a telescope, you can do it like this, and you see a, a cardboard shade, a collar, to try to cast uh, uh, some shadow um, that will, so that the bright sunlight will not completely wash out the image that's projected onto the paper. I thought this was a clever way to do it. Um, this involves a trip to an auto parts store. Uh, you get a plastic funnel and uh, some hose clamps. The translucent plastic there is a piece of a shower curtain. And you clamp that over the, uh, the large end of the funnel, uh, clamp an eyepiece that you kind of have to dedicate to this um, at the lower end of the funnel. And then you put it into the telescope. This is a refractor and you can see the shade there made of uh, probably heavy cardboard. And this is okay. This would not be a good method for uh, uh, counting sunspots, but 
it would show some, and this is a good method for uh, showing the, uh, the sun to the public. This is how I do it. This is my telescope. It's a uh, 30 half inch, 90 millimeter Questar uh, Maxitov catadioptric telescope. And you can see the um, glass filter over the aperture. It's um, it screws onto the aperture, so it's not going to fall off. Now you can, if, if you, you can get a, uh, a mylar filter and you can uh, fit it over the end of your telescope, but you need to tape it on there so it's not going to blow off in a gust of wind or fall off and let an unfiltered blast of concentrated sunlight into your eye. This is the solar filter that came with the telescope. And this is why I got started looking at the sun because it was just part of the equipment that came with the telescope. Um, it's a stop down version. Uh, this screws into the same threads that the full aperture filter screws into, but it's a one and a half inch or 40 millimeter solar filter. And that's what I made my first observations with. And that's what I used to discover the rotation of the sun. This is the case that it comes in. Um, I mentioned this because I got so, I won't say addicted, but so enthusiastic about solar observing that during the standard time months when the sun rises too late and sets too early for me to observe it from home, I would carry this to the office. And I worked in a healthcare setting. So if anybody who didn't know me saw it, uh, they would probably think it was a microscope. In fact, uh, this is what it looks like on the inside, the, the telescope uh, in its cavity. And then there are three legs that come with it and they fit into holes in, in the uh, base, which also has a clock drive. So you can set it up on a, you know, a, a tripod on a table. And then there's an electric cord there. It has a clock drive that runs on uh, AC current pouch at the top. Uh, holds uh, one holds an eyepiece and the other uh, flatter one holds the solar filter. Um, I was um, when I went to Hawaii to observe the uh, great uh, solar eclipse, total eclipse in uh, 1991. The, the eclipse lasted seven and a half minutes. That's about as long as it is possible for a solar eclipse to last. Uh, got there and we were clouded out that morning. Uh, it, was, it was disappointing is, is an understatement. We got to see a partial phase after the clouds moved on. We didn't get to see totality at all. Otherwise, it was a great trip. Uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't take anything uh, for it. But uh, on the way back, I had the telescope in the plane as part of my carry-on luggage. And I was getting off the plane and the, uh, the captain, the pilot, said, uh, oh, is that a microscope? And I said, no, it's a telescope, and explained briefly to him uh, what it was and why I had it with me. This is how you find the sun. Uh, you use the shadow, and you minimize the shadow. This is the shadow of the telescope in its equatorial mount when I've just, uh, I've just put it onto the tripod, and it's pointed, uh, its optical axis is pointed uh, as close to the North Celestial Pole, Polaris, as I can manage uh, during the daytime, then uh, rotate a little bit, and then you minimize the shadow, make the shadow as small as possible, and then the sun is going to be uh, pretty much in the in the middle of your field of view. Now, I have a solar filter over the finder. The finder on this telescope is a uh, a small mirror about the size of a nickel, uh, and it reflects sunlight into uh, the telescope. You move uh, prisms in and out of the way to bring light, either to block light from or bring light in through the main uh, main mirror. But this uh, solar filter is on a hinge, and you can snap it over the uh, the lens that uh, emits light into the telescope. And it's so it's uh, safe to use the solar filter. And if you're using a, a, a straight through filter, I mean, a straight through uh, finder, uh, cap it. Uh, 
if you don't put or you put a solar filter on it or cap it all together so that neither you nor a bystander is tempted to take a look through it and, and get hurt. Okay, anatomy of sunspots. Um, the, the big dark spot is called an umbra from Latin word for shadow, the penumbra, uh, also from Latin pen meaning or, uh, uh, about or, or almost. Uh, penumbra is almost an umbra, almost a shadow. It's like peninsula. Insula is the Latin word for island, and a peninsula is an almost island like Florida. Uh, you can see the granules there that we discussed earlier and the intergranular lanes. That's the dark area around these uh, Texas-sized packets of, of hot gas and plasma. Uh, pores are very small uh, sunspots. I'm not sure I would call those pores. I think the uh, some of these others here, like this one and this one, um, uh, maybe pores, and you can see the size indicated up there. The whole group, the length of that group, is about um, uh, uh, forty thousand miles long by twenty-seven thousand miles wide. You see the metric uh, equivalent below that, so it's it's really big. This is the sunspot classification system that's uh, still in use. Uh, they start with A groups. These are the simplest groups. This is how most sunspots form, how you first see them. Uh, not always, you know, sometimes they'll come out and, and uh, they'll appear more complex than that. But the A groups, sometimes just a single spot or maybe two or three spots. A B group, uh, you, they'll come in at least in pairs and you can see uh, one pole and the other. Uh, if you can, if you can uh, have the equipment to determine the polarity of it, C groups become more complex, all the way up to F groups, the very, very big, very complex groups. These are the ones that are likely to throw uh, flares um, because of the complexity of the magnetic fields, the tangling of them, the uh, breaking, and then the reconnection of magnetic fields. Uh, F groups are the, are the big ones. Those are the naked eye size sunspots. That is the ones you can see without optical aid, but safely filtered. Um, then um, G groups are not quite so much, H groups. Uh, it's not, this is not the progression of every sunspot. They don't all start as A, go through F and wind up with J and disappear. Uh, a groups come and go as A groups. Some B groups come and go as B groups. Uh, if they get as big as E and F size groups, uh, then they, they have developed, they don't just all just blossom like that. They, they develop and then over time they will decay and then you will see them unless they, as long as they are on the face of the sun where you can see them, um, then they will, they will decay through the G and H uh, um, and uh, are eventually down to the, to the J type groups. The wolf number, or as he would pronounce it, wolf. Um, Rudolf Wolf was the director of the Zurich, Switzerland Observatory uh, starting in 1864. He used uh, an 83 millimeter F16 refractor to observe the sun. And he had read Schwab's paper. He decided to make the sunspot cycle a focus of his research and you know, study. Now, that telescope was a lot better than Schwab's, and he could see more with it. Um, what a, a lot of what Schwab thought were individual, big individual spots were really clusters of much smaller spots. And so Wolf, in thinking about it, decided that the relative amount of solar activity, that is the groups, were more important than individual spots. Groups were more important than spots. So he established, uh, he looked at a ratio between his observations and Schwab's. Uh, turns out it was about, uh, you had to multiply his by, by 0.6 to come up with numbers that were comparable to, to Schwab's to maintain continuity. And so this is the relative sunspot number symbolized by R. This is the uh, formula for it, uh, K times the uh, 10G plus S where K is the individual's factor. This is K from the German word constant. Uh, that's applied by an organization. You don't apply this to your own observations. The organizations to which you submit it uh, go through a series of calculations to come up with your constant factor. G is the number of groups. 
and S is the number of spots. So that uh, if you have one group with one spot, consisting of one spot, an A group such as we saw a minute ago, then that is the, the, the R, the relative sunspot number is 10 times that one group is 10 plus one. So the smallest sunspot index is gonna be 11. Okay, you will see in summary data, you will see numbers smaller than that, but that's because it's an average and yet that factors in how many people thought uh, saw no sunspots and how many saw one or how many saw you know, a group with maybe two sunspots uh, over a 24 hour period. But uh, for, your, for a, a one, one count, one observation, if you see a group that has one spot, the index, the R number is 11. So you've got three groups and a total of 27 spots. That's three times 10 is 30 plus 27. So the R, the relative sunspot number is 57 in that case. The K factor of about uh, 0.6 remained a target. This was really, this is, this is, there's nothing holy about that. Everybody's got a K factor, and if you submit uh, your observations to an organization, they will calculate your K factor. The idea is to do it consistently. No matter what your K factor is, uh, uh, keep it consistent so that, that uh, they can count on your observations meaning the same thing. The AEVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, still uses the K factor in their determination of the numbers they publish. Uh, now, they calculate it for an individual only when the relative sunspot number was more than 100 for at least six months in the preceding year. So they haven't done it since about 2017 or 2018. Um, so, so the sunspot index and long-term solar observations, I'll get into the organizations uh, more in a few minutes, uh, stopped using that in 2015. Alfred Wolfer succeeded um, uh, Wolf in the late 19th century. He had better equipment and uh, uh, she also decided to start using Wolfer's uh, uh, method and uh, the better resolution. So and they're, they're in the process of recalibrating that data series going back uh, into the 19th century. But the Sunspot observations have been going on in a, a pretty systematic manner telescopically since Galileo. So this is the longest data series in the history of science. Okay, this is a drawing that I made uh, you know, on April 12, 1981. Uh, some big groups, complex groups. Uh, how do you tell groups apart? Sometimes it's not all that easy. You can look at this, uh, this drawing here, and uh, you can see some really big groups uh, surrounded by other spots. And the question is, what, which ones are part of the same group, which are other groups? And so at that time, uh, I, I made my count and I interpreted that as 20 separate groups comprising 262 individual spots. So my relative sunspot index for that day was 20 times 10 is 200 plus 262. So the RI, R sub I, R individual, the I standing for individual, my individual relative sunspot number for the day was 462. Now, we talked about uh, faculty a little earlier. If the spots share faculty material they're part, probably part of the same group. So here in this satellite photograph, you can see a lot of faculty and you can see that uh, they surround some sunspots, sunspot groups. So in all probability, those are part of the same group, but where they are not, where they're separate, then chances are those are separate groups. Now you don't see it like this. You don't see it at those wavelengths, but uh, you do, you do, you can see faculty on, on days of good seeing, uh, and if you see uh, the faculty in and around sunspot groups, and it, it appears to be connected, then I interpret that most people would as being part of the same group. But it's not always hard to decide what's a group. Okay, this is June twentieth this year. Um, it was 
one group, two spots, the individual, the R sub I is 12. And you can see in that drawing, it looks like a little white uh, area crossing the main umbra. That is a, I interpreted that as a light bridge over the main umbra. This is a, a, a photograph of a light bridge. Here you can see that solar granulation and you can see that light bridge crossing the, the main umbra, both of those. Um, a light bridge is an arc of bright plasma that goes across. It's, it's not splitting the umbra. It, we're, we're looking down on it and uh, it, it acts, it, it, it appears to be a, a bridge that you know, links um, a couple of magnetic poles within that, uh, that sunspot. Um, it may signal the breakup of the sunspot. It may be a hint that the sunspot is going to go away. How about reporting your data? I mean, if you, if you don't report it, what you, of what use is it? I mean, it's, it's interesting to do it uh, and just keep your own log, but uh, you, you might as well submit it uh, and contribute to the, the, this continuous uh, flow of data, this long running string of observations that goes back 400 years. There are two main organizations that maintain these solar indices. Uh, the first one we've mentioned is the long-term solar observations, um, uh, the SILSO division of the uh, Solar Influences Data Analysis Center, SDIC, which in turn is part of the World Data Center, WDC, at the Royal Observatory of Belgium in Brussels. The other is the AAVSO, American Association of Variable Star Observers, which I joined in 1980. Been, I joined the Memphis Astronomical Society in 1979, and then got interested enough in astronomy in general and uh, the sun and variable stars, that variable stars you observe at night. So I joined the AEVSO and started observing um, variable stars. I did it at night as well as during the day. Um, the sky got so bad, the light pollution got so bad, it was hard to find comparison stars. And I pretty well abandoned the nighttime uh, variable star observing, but kept on during the day, light pollution does not interfere with observing the sun. The SDIC's predecessor began at Zurich in 1864 when Wolf became the director there. Uh, in 1981, after Max Waldemeyer retired, they moved it to the program to the Royal Observatory of Belgium. Waldemeyer was a, a, a great contributor to uh, solar uh, observations, but he was a difficult guy to get along with. And when he left, uh, somebody took the telescope and mounted it in his own garden. Um, and it was the, it was sort of in disarray at Zurich. And so the International Sunspot Program was moved to the Royal Observatory of Belgium at that time. The AAVSO Sunspot Program began in 1944. This was because uh, communication with Zurich was difficult. And during World War II, Switzerland was surrounded by Axis countries and the uh, Italy and Germany and um, Austria, which Germany had annexed in uh, 1938. And they did not allow um, allied countries, their opponents in World War II, to access the scientific data that came out of Zurich if they could help it. Um, so uh, shortwave communication was vital to the war effort, especially in the Navy. Communication with ships at sea and in particular submarines. And solar activity can affect the Earth's ionosphere and the propagation of shortwave radio. So they needed to find out what the sun was doing on a day-to-day -day basis so that they could anticipate um, changes in the ionosphere and choose frequencies, uh, shortwave radio frequencies that were more likely to be able to connect with the radios in the ships and in the submarines. The ABSO had experienced solar observers, so that's where they went to find it the uh, observers to do this program and the sunspot, American sunspot program continued after the war ended. This is how I used to report data. We all, when all of us who were doing it then, 
um, the old fashioned paper report. This was 19 July, 1981. You wrote it down on a form, pre-printed form, and you mailed it into them. Now, I always kept a copy uh, and you can see um, in the uh, left-hand column, uh, you'll see uh, letters and numbers. The letters, uh, uh, P is poor, G is good, E is excellent, and F is fair. Uh, the numeral or numerals after that give an estimate of the portion of the sky covered by clouds. So eight is 80% cloud cover, three is 30% cloud cover, and so on. Uh, on days when it was totally clouded over, just for my own use, I put in P, poor, uh, because 100% of the cloud of the sky was covered. And uh, then you can make uh, remarks out uh, on the, in, in the, uh, the right. Now, I, I blocked out uh, my old address, the house that I lived in at the time, because this is going to get posted on YouTube. And I don't think it would, the people who live in that house would like getting mail uh, that had to do with uh, solar observation or just crank mail, you know, because uh, the way that some people are today. About a month after submitting uh, observations, the solar bulletin came out and it comes out about, about two weeks uh, after the end of the month at present and it comes out electronically. It came out on paper uh, at that time and on page one, it would have a summary of solar activity and a graph. And on page two, most of that page was covered with uh, radio observations. This is sudden ionospheric disturbance measurements um, that um, you, can, you can build and people would build it. You couldn't go and buy in a shop. You couldn't go buy a ready-made um, the radio equipment for observing sudden ionospheric disturbances. You had to make them. And, in the solar bulletin, it would be often, uh, there'd be several pages of, of uh, diagrams of how to, how to construct this. I never did that. I was not into amateur radio, uh, but there were a number of people who were. But down in the, you can see the box there on the lower right, that's where they would list the uh, relative sunspot numbers of the American sunspot number, R sub A, and the international, R sub I. Um, for the month, I would look at uh, my um, so my submissions, and I would look at the days when I did not, I could not observe, like uh, on the first, uh, say, in the fifth and the sixth of July, nineteen eighty-one. I could not observe because it was cloudy, so I lined those out uh, so that they didn't go into my calculations of. Um, the relationship of my observations to the composite observations. That was, and it turned out that that month, uh, it was exactly 0.6, that is, uh, you multiply my, uh, my total um, uh, and by 0.6, and you get the AEVSO relative sunspot number. My mentor at the time was Cap uh, Hosfield. Uh, his name was Casper, and went by Cap. Um, another uh, mentor was uh, Carolyn Hurlis. Uh, she was a, a lovely woman. She was, uh, uh, she observed uh, variable stars at night as well as the sun. And she was a good friend uh, of Leslie Peltier. He was her mentor. Leslie Peltier uh, wrote the wonderful book, Starlight Nights about observing uh, variable stars. If you've never read it, uh, get a copy. It's a, it's a great read. And uh, sadly, uh, Cap and uh, Carolyn are, are no longer with us. But they advised me to make a graph, and this was on paper that AVSO would supply you. And you can see the labels there at the top. Um, the x-axis is the AVSO relative sunspot number, and the y-axis is your individual counts. So I would calculate my ratio, my uh, observations to theirs and my total to theirs, 0.6 in this case, draw a line uh, with that slope. And then I would plot my observations against theirs. So that's the, that's the dots and the uh, label with the dates and so forth. Uh, what you want to see is your observations close to that line as possible, a, a very thin cloud of observations that match that, that line. 
there were some that looked to be outliers. And I would circle those and I would go back and look at my um, observations, the conditions in my log. I would keep more detailed uh, writing in, in the log book. And I can even go, could even go back and look at, uh, at drawings like this. I didn't do that every day. I did it um, maybe uh, every couple of days. And now I do it maybe once a week or so just to keep track of what the sun looked like uh, at the time. And I could go back and see if maybe I had misinterpreted, I had overcounted uh, uh, groups that uh, counted spots and groups of spots as being separate groups entirely instead of being part of uh, one big group. This is how we do it now. It's all online. This is uh, the modern AEVSO data entry. It's, uh, it's a program written in Java. And uh, I have asked the uh, woman who's the uh, computer uh, guru uh, data coordinator at AEVSO, please, please do this on a web page so that we don't have to fool with Java, which can get kind of wonky at times. Um, and she said, yeah, that's on the to-do list, but she has several other things on her plate at present. So uh, we're still using the Java entry system. So you start up the Java uh, program, the Java file, and this is what it shows you. And I blacked out my observer um, ID because, uh, the, again, this is going to be posted in public, and that's you know, AVSO needs to know it, and I need to know it, but nobody else does. Uh, what shows up when you enter your username and your password is this uh, this window here. It, it fills in the year and the month, and then you fill in the rest of it, the day, uh, the hour and the minute in universal time, that is what we used to call Greenwich Mean Time, uh, that is uh, five hours ahead of uh, central daylight time, uh, which it is in Memphis or during standard time months, it's six hours ahead of central standard time. Uh, then you sold it out and seeing the number of groups, the number of spots, and it calculates the wolf number like this. Uh, this was June 19th, I observed at uh, 9.05 a.m. central daylight time, so it was 14.05 uh, universal time. It was good seeing. Um, you, you, you come to judge that based on experience. Uh, you, it, it's, it's, uh, you, you just have to kind of develop your own standards for it, but uh, it becomes everybody eventually uh, comes to pretty much the same judgment of seeing conditions. This was good, good seeing. Uh, one group, four spots, so the wolf number was 14. And then you hit uh, add and it puts it down into this part of the window. Then down at the bottom, you click upload to the database. It sends it to AEVSO. Um, and then you can save it to a text file. Um, I do that and it maintains a text file month by month. Uh, so I can go back and check that. I also maintain paper logs and I keep a copy on the old AEVSO form uh, because uh, that way I can look at it in a hurry. I can go back uh, decades. Uh, before I had a computer and look up information. Uh, don't have to plug it in, don't have to worry about new operating systems or uh, bugs getting into programs or anything. Paper is still a, a, a good medium. This is how the uh, WDC SILSO data entry page looks. Again, I blocked out my username. The password is a series of dots, so you know what it was. Uh, so you enter username, password, hit submit query, and it takes you to this page um, here that it knows that's me and it puts me up there at the top. And I don't mind if people know that. It's my William M. Wilson, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, or actually I don't anymore. I, uh, I got de-annexed from Memphis in January of this year and the, my back fence is the Memphis city limits. So I can go back there and put my hand over the fence. My hand is in Memphis and the rest of me isn't. Um, the SILSO fills in um, the month and the year and the day. And then I put in the time, the quality of the seeing number of groups, sunspots, it calculates the wolf number. Uh, some people put in the north, south, and center 
groups of sunspots. I tend not to do that. I can, I'm pretty sure what's north and south. I'm not so sure about uh, uh, the division between north, south, and center, what's in center and what's, what's not, um, because I'm, I, I'm not projecting this onto a grid that has uh, those kinds of measurements. So that, that, all that is optional. So I put down uh, just the, uh, the same data that I send to the AV. So I started submitting data to SILSO in 2010. I've been submitting to AVSO since September 1980. I've submitted over 9,000 observations to the AVSO um, and uh, 2,700 and something to uh, SILSO since, uh, since 2010. Uh, so I, I average uh, sending in about 20 observations per month. It works out to 240, 250 observations per year. So I may hit 10,000 in the next three years or so. Uh, but that's kind of a kind of a goal of mine. And this is what the uh, entry page looks like after I uh, put the data into SILSO. I don't do correlations on uh, and graphing on paper anymore because Excel does that heavy lifting for me. Uh, so while I put together spreadsheets, and you can you can get this, you go to AVSO's website to the solar section, and uh, I submitted um, this spreadsheet and one for SILSO uh, to them uh, and another one, another uh, spreadsheet that I'll, I'll get to uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, and you can download these uh, if you decide to observe the sun. What I do, what this does is, is compare my observations to the uh, AVSO composite, uh, RI, meaning my individual observations, and RA, the American sunspot number. Um, and then I calculate the ratio between the two. Um, down at the bottom, it gives you summaries. Um, there is in the number of observations, the mean of each, the standard deviation of each, the correlation coefficient, uh, one being a perfect correlation, which you just don't get. Um, but 91 is a pretty good one. Uh, R square is a, uh, an estimate of the variance common to the, to the two. Uh, series of observations, and then my estimated uh, individual constant. Now that's that's just the composite ratio. That's not what they they the formula is kind of long, and they don't do it uh, when there are this few sunspots around anyway. Uh, but you can see down at the bottom it graphs. Now well, here you got small number uh, of observations, so. Uh, you don't see a clear pattern, but you get over here in April and May, there are a lot more observations. And here you're seeing them along, pretty much along a straight line. That's what you want to see. It's, it's consistent uh, with what other people are observing. I'll do the same thing for SILSO, and you'll notice that they are a little bit different. Uh, you can go back, look at the grass down there at the bottom. And you see the shapes change a little bit. This is because we're we are seeing somewhat different things. This is based mostly on time of day of the observation. Most of the uh, SILSO SIDC um, observers uh, are in Europe, and most of the AEVSO observers are in North America. Uh, and the time difference between Central or Eastern Europe and um, uh, the West Coast, for example, of uh, the United States is anywhere from um, uh, five to five or six hours up to maybe 10 hours. And during that time, sunspots can change. The solar activity can change. And sometimes I see something they didn't see. Sometimes they see something I didn't see. And so that's reflected in those numbers. Down at the bottom of the statistics part, I have it calculate the agreement, the correlation between the American sunspot number and the international sunspot number. You can see on the second line there from the, from the bottom, uh, very high correlations, not perfect. And then the R square is the variance common to the two. Um, a lot of agreement, but it's not 100%. And the, the main difference is the, is the time, the time difference. Now, a lot of contributors to the AEVSO also contribute to SILSO. I'm one of them, maybe, I don't know, 40% or 40, 50% do. Uh, how many people do this 
for each organization. In a given month, AVSO gets contributions from maybe 60, 65 people. Uh, still, so it's a, a comparable number. And there's an overlap because some of these are the same people. So how many people are doing this around the world on a regular basis? I'm guessing maybe 100, uh, not many more than that. Spaceweather.com is a really, really good resource. Uh, there on the left side of the page, you see a, a, a photograph of the sun. This is a SOHO photograph, the Solar um, uh, and Heliospheric Observatory uh, in orbit. And it's labeled with the uh, sunspot uh, group numbers. This, these are assigned by National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Um, toward uh, the, the bottom of that same column there, the sunspot number um, and a link to explanation of how that's calculated. Uh, and then the number of spotless days. Uh, and you can see as you move down toward the bottom, um, the down at the bottom of that, uh, of that page, you can see in 2012, 2013, not a single day was spotless. But you look up there in uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020, uh, uh, most days were spotless. Uh, that, this is when you're getting the, you're getting the sunspot minimum. Uh, it does not take long at all to do your observation because uh, you get out there and it is as blank as, it's, it's blank as an egg or a cue ball. Um, but now we're getting back into it's the uh, 2021, only 46 days were spotless uh, as of uh, the time this uh, web page was put up. There had been uh, no spotless days. Uh, a couple of days ago, I didn't see any spots. Uh, Silso Observer did, uh, but not many. So um, nowadays you get you see something just about every day uh, so we're getting back into uh, a new sunspot cycle this is the soho uh, photograph uh, blown up a little bit you can see the uh, the group numbers there this is silso's page again there's a lot of great information on this you can uh, click the various links uh, the faq that frequently asks questions the news the latest sunspot bulletin uh, the data series, um, and you get down down here the two uh, uh, solar images here uh, on the lower right side of the page. Uh, the latest USET observations. This the USET is um, the uh, UCLA Solar Equatorial Table. UCLA U C C L E. That is the region, the, the the kind of suburb of Brussels. Belgium, where the Royal Observatory, the ROB, Royal Observatory of Belgium, is located. Um, the uh, uh, UCLA Solar Equatorial Table is on a mount. It's on a, an equatorial mount, and there are three or four telescopes that are mounted on a platform on this. One is white light. Uh, they project it onto, this is, this is like a six-inch refractor. They ref, um, uh, project this onto a, a, a piece of paper pre-printed, and that's, that is this. And then the observer um, takes a pencil and traces over the sunspot projected onto that paper, and then uh, enters the, uh, the, name of, the name of the observer, uh, the date, time, and so forth, and down here at the lower left, the number of groups, the number of spots, and the, the wolf number. This is, you see, the, the languages on this are uh, French and Flemish or Dutch. Those are the two official languages in Belgium. But uh, Silzo website itself is published in English. Um, you can see that uh, uh, in the middle of the page, the, in English, uh, Dutch, and French, the same information, uh, 20, December 2019, confirmed as the starting point of the new activity solar cycle. English is, you know, nowadays is the unofficial international language of science. Uh, and uh, that was not always so. When I was uh, considering uh, graduate school in the early 1960s, most graduate schools required a not reading knowledge of French and German. So I took courses in French and German so that I could uh, qualify. Um, for graduate school when the time came. Turns out uh, that was no longer required when I was applying. But I, I, can, I can still read French pretty well, uh, German not so well. Um, 
but I practiced the French more. This is the white light photograph from the uh, USET uh, solar equatorial table. Um, not, not as sharp as, a, as a, uh, a satellite photograph, but this is taken through the atmosphere. This is another solo photograph. And <clears throat> I, I got to wondering about calculating the size, measuring the size of these sunspots. They're great big, great big features on the sun. Um, this is, for example, the sunspot group, the, the, the big one there, 2674. Uh, as it appeared on September 2nd, 2017. This is my drawing of the same thing. Now it's reversed left for right because that's what my telescope does. It gives an upright image, but it reverses left to right because there are three reflections involved in setting that image up. So what we're looking at here, we, we can treat the sun and the sunspot for short time periods, uh, the, the, the very, very, very few minutes that it takes to do this observation. Treat that as a stationary object. It isn't really, but you know, for all practical purposes, it is. And we're observing from a rotating platform. The Earth rotates 360 degrees in 24 hours. So that means you divide that by 24, that's 15 degrees per hour. And that means it's a quarter of a degree or 15 arc minutes per minute or a quarter of an arc minute, 15 arc seconds per second. That's how fast the Earth is rotating under the, the allegedly, uh, for all practical purpose, stationary sun and the sunspot. So I timed the exit from the eyepiece, did, did not have a clock drive running, just let the uh, sun rotate, move out of the field of view, timed the exit of the eyepiece from the exit three times, to get a consistent number, if I got a real outlier, uh, I would time it again until I got three that were reasonably close together uh, to reduce experimental error. If it was a real outlier, I knew it was wrong. Uh, I knew I had uh, judged it wrong or I had hit the stopwatch wrong or something. So anyway, from Sky and Telescope Online Almanac, uh, the solar disk, the apparent uh, diameter of the solar disk that day was 31.7 arc minutes. You don't have to go to Sky and Telescope online. You can, be, you probably got you, something in your pocket now. You got a, 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 a planetary software, some very good planetary software that will run on uh, on phones, on Android or or uh, iPhone, and you can get this data. The solar declination that day was 2.1, and you need to take the cosine of that to make a minor correction in this case, but um, a more significant correction uh, when the sun is uh, toward the solstices. Uh, this was very close to the equinox. The, the uh, cosine of zero, which is the declination at the equinox, is one. Uh, we're only a few days uh, near uh, away from the uh, Equinox when this was this observation was made. So the cosine of 2.1 is 0.999. Okay, that's essentially one. So the mean time of the exit time three times, the mean time was 15.07 seconds, uh, making the correction uh, with the cosine 15.05, uh, you know, two hundredths of a second is you know within the this reaction time error. So it really doesn't make any difference in this instance, but at when it's uh, 23 and a half degrees, the declination is 23 and a half, it can make a difference for about eight, eight, nine percent. So um, 15.05, the corrected time, times a quarter of an arc minute is 3.76 arc minutes long. That's how, that's the portion of the sky that group covered. And then you take the ratio of that, well, what percentage of the Solar whole solar disk is that well 3.76 divided by 31.7 is 0.1186. So the group was 11.9 percent of the solar diameter. You know what the solar diameter is because you can look it up. Uh, it's a million three hundred ninety-two thousand five hundred thirty kilometers. So 11.1186, 11.86 percent of that is about 165,000 kilometers or 102,000 miles long, which is almost half the distance between the earth and the moon. That's a, that's, that's a really, really big uh, line of magnetic activity. The sun's a big place. Well, you don't have to do that on pencil and paper anymore because I put this on the 
website, his own EPSO's uh, website. Well, they did it. I mean, I submitted it to him. I said, I think this might be useful. Other people might be interested in it. And they said, yeah, we think so too. So uh, you can go to the AEVSO website, solar section, and you'll find a uh, link, a couple of links there to software. Uh, I forget exactly the phrase now, software that may be helpful or something. Anyway, uh, the two, two spreadsheets I showed you earlier for keeping uh, track of the relationship between your observations and the AEVSO or uh, the International Sunspot Number graphing and all that and statistics, all, that's all there. You can download that, you can download this. All you do is uh, enter the time of the action. You can enter up to four timings. It calculates the mean. You enter the decimal degrees of the sun's declination and the solar diameter of the sun, the apparent diameter in arc minutes. And it does the rest for you. It calculates uh, uh, the, the length of the group, the uh, in kilometers, miles, and arc minutes, and the percent of solar diameter. Sunspot cycles. Uh, we mentioned that already. Schwab discovered that about 11 years. The onset of a new cycle is marked by the reversal of the magnetic pole. Flip is probably, you see that word flip a lot. It's not like instantly it happens. Uh, they, it takes a little while for the reversal for the sun's north and south poles to reverse, but uh, they do approximately every 11 years. So therefore, uh, the complete solar cycle is about 22 years. That is from the original polarity flipped to the opposite and then flipped back to what was the original. It takes about 22 years to get back to the same polarity. Uh, just as a commentary on the side, the Earth's magnetic polarity also reverses, but uh, it does not flip, and it's over many thousands of years uh, between um, uh, changes in uh, polarity. The reversal itself takes several thousand years. The last time the Earth's magnetic poles reversed from their present uh, polarity was about 450,000 years or so ago. Uh, there's some uh, talk now that we may be in the process of reversing again, but it's Nothing that's going to affect us uh, in, in any significant way during our lifetimes. The cycles are numbered. Number one began in, uh, in 1755. That's the earliest date for which we have enough data. Uh, cycle 25, the new one, the current one, began in December 2019. So what's going to happen? Um, in the blurb that was published in the meteorite. I wrote that uh, the estimates uh, as of a couple of years ago were just all over the map. Um, this is Silto's forecast, one, one forecast using one method. Uh, you can see the solid red line projecting up from uh, now up into uh, mid-2022. You can see essentially error bars uh, there either side of it. Um, and they're project by this method, they're projecting that the sunspot number overall will be somewhere around uh, 55 or so. Um, by another method, they're projecting it could be uh, up to about 100 with a somewhat narrower error range. So uh, some theorists I read a few years ago that during the deep minimum that sun forecasting it, no sunspots would form in the new cycle. It wouldn't be a new cycle. It would be just total cue ball blank and maybe a new maunder minimum and it's going to get cold and you know, we'd have bears and things. Um, they were wrong because it's already happening and we can see it happening. Uh, there may be longer cycles on the order of hundreds of years we just don't have enough data yet because we've been observing for 400 years. That seems like a long time. It is in human lifetimes, but it's an eye blink in the life of a star. So we keep observing. What about other stars? Okay, we found out, you know, I, I remember when the first extrasolar planet was discovered. It was around a star called Epsilon Pegasi. I think it was 1995. It was discovered by observing the gravitational wobble uh, caused by the tug of the planet on the star. Um, we have other means of uh, finding planets now, including the wonderful Kepler mission, which looked for occultations. Um, 
So we know there are plenty of planets around other stars. It may be that uh, all stars or almost all stars have planets. Well, what about sunspots? What about star spots? If our sun is anywhere near typical, uh, they probably do have spots on other stars. And very large spots have indeed been detected on some kinds of stars. The spots like those on our sun are undetectable given our uh, instruments at this point. They're just too small. Uh, the changes in brightness uh, would be undetectable. But I think that sun-like stars, uh, G-type stars like, like our sun, almost certainly have spots that are like those on our sun. You know, I, I, I may not ever know that. I may not live long enough to, to know whether that's true or not, but I think it's, it, it's extremely probable. The ones that we have detected are a whole lot bigger than the ones on our sun, but that's a, partly an artifact of the detection, means of detection that we have. That is, we can't detect spots that are a lot smaller than that. So we see the ones that, that, that we can see, and they're big. On rapidly rotating stars, they can use Doppler imaging. That is, a, the, sun, the star spots are cooler than the surrounding areas on the photosphere of those stars. They rotate into view, and that causes some asymmetry in the blue shift of each spectral line. Another imaging technique, the Zeeman Doppler imaging, involves polarization of light and spectral lines, uh, eclipsing binaries. You can get uh, producing images and maps as far as star spots on both stars. And giant stars are big enough that you can use very long baseline interferometry to actually take a picture, of them, like the famous picture of Betelgeuse, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. Slowly rotating stars, you can use a method called line depth ratio that's measuring two different spectral lines. One of them is sensitive to temperature and the other one isn't. Um, because the spots are cooler than the surrounding area, the temperature sensitive line changes depth. And from the difference between the two lines, they can calculate the temperature and the spot size to, to me seeming amazingly within the accuracy of about 10 degrees Kelvin or 18 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, measuring that that small difference from this distance um, is uh, amazing. This is uh, uh, a star, uh, XX Triangulae. The HD stands for Henry Draper, the Henry Draper Catalog, 12545. And that picture shows the size of the sun compared with the size of XX Triangulae. Uh, it's a K-type binary star, and you can guess that from the temperature scale there, the, the uh, hottest part of that star, about 4,800 Kelvin, where the sun is about 5,800 Kelvin. Um, so it's a G-type star. This is a, a, a binary giant about 10 times the size of the sun, 10 times the diameter, and about twice as massive. Uh, it's about 1,500 light years away, and its rotation period is just about that of the sun. Uh, about 24 days, the Earth, I mean, the Sun rotates about 25 days at the equator, 30 at the poles. Uh, this one almost certainly rotates uh, faster at the equator than it does at the poles because, again, it's not a solid body. It rotates differentially, and that differential rate of rotation, we think, is the main reason for sunspot formation. There's a super spot was detected, it um, would measure out at about 12 to 20 solar radii. Another star, Zeta Andromedae, um, this is an image of that. And um, um, it's not, uh, not advancing the slides here, I'm not sure why. There we go. Uh, it's also a K-type star. It's a little closer, a lot closer, 180 light years or so away. It's about 15 times uh, the diameter of our sun. And it rotates really, really fast. And I don't understand uh, this. As big as it is, how does it rotate that fast? Uh, 20 times as fast as the sun. That means it's rotating once about every little over a day uh, instead of uh, almost a month like the sun. 
it has a smaller binary companion. Well, how about red giants and super giants? These are really, really big stars, 100 to 1,000 times the diameter of our sun. Our sun will become one in a couple of billion years. Um, they seem to have fewer but larger convective cells than the, than the sun. Uh, again, we're limited in our instrumentation. There's a star called Pi Gruis, which uh, uh, you, this would be visible, is visible from our latitude, the latitude of Memphis, 45 degrees north latitude. Uh, the, the declination of that star is uh, negative 45 or so, and the, the horizon here is about negative 55. So it is visible from here. Uh, it was imaged in detail in 2017 using the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope. It can, seem, it can be seen better from the Southern Hemisphere than from here. They found um, uh, a few convective cells. Each one of them were just enormous, 120 million kilometers across. Uh, by comparison, our sun has maybe 2 million convective cells, and each one is about 1,000 miles across, 900 or so miles across, again, size of Texas or France, if you're in Europe. Red giants rotate more slowly than they did as main sequence stars because they've expanded and angular momentum has to be conserved. Diameter is a lot, uh, a lot greater. Uh, and you got all the, the conventional example of this is an ice skater. Okay, this is uh, uh, ice skater is spinning with her arms uh, held closely to her side. She extends her arms out to the side. She slows down. Why? Because angular moment, momentum has to be conserved. The slow rotation, they think, reduces magnetic activity, uh, preventing spots from forming. Uh, and a recent article, 2020, uh, they surveyed 4,500 red giants, found about 8% of them to have spots. And of those, maybe 15% uh, appeared to have acquired angular momentum from a binary companion. And they think others may have acquired it from planets that were engulfed and from binary companions. Um, speaking of engulfing, but when the sun becomes a red giant, which it will in a couple of billion years, um, it's going to swallow up the inner planets. Uh, Mercury and Venus are goners for sure. Uh, the Earth might be, but uh, we're not certain of that yet. It won't make any difference because um, it will be so hot on the Earth by that time uh, from the expanding star that it will have boiled off all the water and all the atmosphere will be gone. It will be a, a really hot rock. More massive stars um, may have had lower magnetic activity as main sequence stars uh, that prevented material from escaping in the solar wind or their solar wind, the stellar wind, and preserving enough to uh, uh, display spots as red giants. These are um, ideas about why these, uh, these stars may show, uh, show the spots that they do. Metal jets. Uh, this is the... Uh, Bright, the brightest star in, or uh, normally the brightest star in the constellation of Orion, the shoulder of the red star and his shoulder. And you can see there in these images, these were done by long baseline interferometry. Uh, January 19, showing a, its typical self. And then December 19, 20, 19, uh, 2019, you can see uh, a big dark place on it. And then there are light curves there on the bottom of that, uh, that image. Normal magnitude range it right from this about uh, zero magnitude, 0 0.1 magnitude down to 1.0 over about 400 days, give or take. And that decreased all the way down to 1.6 uh, between November 2019 and March of 2020. This, this is a longer time series. The gaps uh, between the, the uh, uh, plots there. Uh, are times when Betelgeuse could not be observed because it was too close to the sun in our sky. And you see along uh, the, in the 90s, the mid 90s, early 2000s, it kind of moved, you know, rocked along in its usual variation. And then uh, about 10 years later, you saw more variation. And then in uh, the late 20 teens, 2018, 2019, and then 2020, just huge dips. And so the question is, what's going on? Well, if you were around, you watched the Gordon Parker meeting on April 9th, um, Tom Calderwood gave a really excellent talk 
to us. This is available on our um, YouTube channel, the Memphis Astronaut Society. So if you missed that, go back and look at it. It was a very good talk. Um, several possible causes for this uh, were discussed, including uh, dust clouds, star spots. Uh, the latest on this, it, it burped. Um, it expelled a large cloud of gas that cooled and obscured it. Uh, relatively cool areas, that's maybe spots form. This allowed a cloud of dust to condense into solid particles, dimming its light. Well, red giants and super giants expel dust all the time, but not as dense clouds. Uh, it disperses quickly enough to allow light to penetrate it, but it does not cool off uh, enough to obscure the star like this. Uh, so this was maybe a special case. We still don't know for sure. So in the words of the, uh, the old TV series, uh, the X-Files, keep your eyes on the skies. The truth is out there. There's some resources online that uh, I think would uh, be helpful if you want more information. AVSO, uh, you can use aevso.org. You can go to the solar section on that. There's a, a lot of really good information, including a, another uh, historical article called Dances with Wolves um, uh, uh, by uh, Carl, I think it was by Carl Fuhrer, who was a chairman of the uh, solar division for uh, several years. Uh, Silso's website, again, we've looked at some of those space, space weather, we've covered that. And for a really good history, of the observation of the sun, the 315-year-old science experiment. This is, uh, uh, you can just Google that. I mean, you can, you can go to our website and there's no need to write all this stuff down and, and then uh, try to remember it. Uh, just put in 315-year-old science experiment on Google and it will probably take you to this very interesting paper, very uh, well-explained, uh, very clear explanations and so forth. So um, at this point, um, I'm going to uh, take uh, the advice of Will Rogers uh, and the, the, my favorite Will Rogers quote is, uh, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. And I will do that. And if you have questions, I will try to answer them. Bill, I don't know what other questions are out there, but we did have one from uh, Freddie asked about Zeta Andromeda. Uh, it appeared oblong in your image, and that's a that's a projection. That's like a Mercator projection of, of the of the Earth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the star itself is not uh, elliptical like that. Well, that fast rotation might we we thought possibly. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't. I think that's uh. It's uh, we can. Uh, I think that is that's just uh, a, a projection of the of the whole star uh, in in one in one uh, image instead of uh, rounding, you can't see the other side. Oh, you know, all, projection, I think. Hater projection, yeah. Yeah, like like a, a map of the earth. You, you've seen those and uh, where you see the whole earth uh, spread out in, a, in an oval. So another question uh, in our chat, Steve Wright, uh, do you use, um, do you get a, Full view, full disk view of the sun in your telescope, or is it zoomed in? Oh yes, I do. the The magnification that I use is is uh, right about eighty, and that gives me I can see the whole disk um, in the eyepiece. Now, you know, I can I can uh, increase the magnification and see part of it if I want to, but uh, I. I almost never do because the seeing conditions just, just don't permit it. Uh, during the day, the air is more turbulent than it is at night. Uh, the best seeing conditions for observing the sun are the crummiest conditions for observing deep sky objects. Uh, what you want is haze. That means the air is very still and you don't have uh, uh, packets of air of different temperatures, which means different densities, which means different refraction. Uh, that gives you the scintillation when, you, when, a, when a cold front comes through and it blows out all of the dust and smoke and haze and so forth. And you see these, this deep blue sky, transparent, wonderful stuff. If you look at the sun, it typically looks like you're looking through six feet of running water. 
because of the different uh, densities of the air packets that you have to stare through. Uh, so I have to wait a day or so, at, typically after a cold front, but to get good seeing. All right. Does anyone else have any more questions? Feel free to unmute your mic and ask it directly or type it in the chat. Bill, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you for your continuous contribution to science. Uh, this, uh, you know, I've known for a long time that astronomy is one of the few hobbies where the hobbyists can contribute to the uh, body of knowledge of science and, and do so regularly. I, uh, I got pretty involved in all uh, involved in occultation timings for a long time. And uh, I think that Sarita had a question. Huh? Say again, Freddie. I think that Sarita had a question. She she raised her hand. Hey, Freddie, that was that was clap. It was a reaction. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, again, we'll uh, be meeting the uh, uh, one Saturday this month, I forgot what it was, uh, for the Memphis Astrophotography Group. Um, it's always on the Saturday nearest the full moon. So we picked the night you can't be, should probably wouldn't be out doing uh, astrophotography to try to uh, come indoors and and talk about it uh, on Zoom. So thank y'all very much. Y'all have a good evening and um, uh, look for this video to be posted on uh, uh, YouTube when Jeremy gets back from his vacation. So thank y'all very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Bill.